Well, kia ora tato. Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to episode five of the current Dairy NZ Farmers Forum series, which also happens to be the final episode in the current series as well. It has been so much fun. Tonight's theme is better together. After all, we're all after the same thing in terms of achieving shared environmental aspirations. There are some real challenges ahead of us in the coming decades when it comes to improving water quality, increasing biodiversity, and also reducing emissions. We all have a part to play in achieving much improved environmental outcomes. So how do we do this? and what is the way forward. My name is Rowena Duncan, executive producer of the Country Radio Show and a former dairy farmer myself. And it's my honour to once again facilitate this evening's session. Tonight, we're going to hear from Dr. David Berger, GM of Sustainable Dairy at Dairy NZ. We've got Ray Grubb, Chair of Fish and Game New Zealand, and also an expert panel, including Nicola Torkey, Chief Executive for Forest and Bird, Melissa Slattery, Chair of the Dairy Environment Leaders Group, and also Richard McIntyre, dairy farmer and deputy chair for Fish and Game. Now, for the technical side of things, and it's actually really simple, to submit questions for our speakers this evening, and you can do this at any time, all you have to do is connect to menti.com, either by scanning the QR code on your screen now, or by typing in menti.com to your browser and entering the code 9049 9759. All we ask is that if you're asking a question, please just write who your question's directed to as well so we can direct it to the right person. And just a note, if your connection is buffering or if you're on mobile data, you can easily ensure your quality setting on Vimeo is set to auto so that if connection drops, the quality will reduce rather than stop. Noreda, let's get into it. First up to kick us off, I'd like to welcome in Dr. David Berger, Dairy NZ GM of Sustainable Dairy. And uh, David, welcome in. I understand you are joining us from the Waikato. It's so strange, isn't it, to think that today would have been day one of field days. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, Rowena. And um, thankfully, it's not field days day today because the weather has been absolutely atrocious and the whole pit <laughs> yeah. would have got blown away. Oh, I can imagine. I've been hearing some horror stories. So really looking forward to November when we can uh, absolutely rock field days at Mystery Creek in our jandals. Now, David, on to the matters at hand. Look, I've noticed a big shift, actually, in the way that Dairy and Z have been engaging with NGOs like Fish and Game over the last year or two, uh, which I'm sure will be welcomed by a lot of farmers who are also hunters fishers and environmentalists. Can you tell me a little bit about how this came about, what's driven the shift and why it's so important? Yeah, absolutely. And um, kia tato, everybody. So it's great um, to be having this conversation tonight because I honestly don't believe we could have had this 10 years ago or even two or five years ago. Um, and it's really important that we do have this conversation between the dairy sector and the environmental NGOs because we know that if we work together we can solve these problems together and meet our collective aspirations for the environment. Um, so it's fair to say that there has been a lot of tension between the dairy sector and the environmental NGOs over several years, um, starting, starting when dairy was expanding quite rapidly, sort of in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And on reflection, yes, of course, a lot of that criticism was fair, and the questions that were being asked were probably also fair, but you know, some of it wasn't at the time. Campaigns like Dirty Dairying went quite far and caused a lot of hurt for our farming families and, and rural communities. And farmers felt they were being unfairly targeted, targeted and singled out. So some of those families had been farming for many, many generations and were wondering why they were suddenly um, being criticised publicly. And also, of course, a lot of new farmers moving to the sector um, at the encouragement of local and central government uh, to sort of improve the well-being of New Zealand Inc. and the economy and what have you in their communities. And again, all of a sudden, they were at that forefront of that, that dirty dairying campaign. But, you know, I think the good news is um, all of that is, is really in the past for, for, for a lot of the environmental NGOs. And that's, that's really exciting uh, because we know that when we do work together, we can achieve uh, much better outcomes. And I think um, reflecting on why, this is, why the timing is right now to be having this conversation is that there are a couple of, a couple of factors which I think are, are really important. The first is that on, um, on many levels, we, we do share the same environmental aspirations. You know, we all want clean water, healthy ecosystems, lower emissions, better biodiversity outcomes. And I think that's really exciting. That's what farmers want. That's what the local communities want. And that's what we want as a sector as well for, for ourselves and for our, for our consumer markets. 
So that's really important. We have a lot, in, a lot in common and a lot of things that we can share um, as we work towards them. And I think the second important part is that over the last decade, um, we've taken as a dairy sector a lot more ownership of these environmental challenges. And we've, we've taken the res- responsibility quite, quite seriously. So we've had a lot of environmental change programs underway uh, with farmers and farmers have risen up to that challenge as well. And a lot of stuff has been happening on farm to, to reduce the environmental footprint and to ensure that we are managing environmental risk better. So, for example, initiatives like the Dairy Water Accord in our current uh, Dairy Tomorrow strategy have had a very targeted focus on, on improving our footprint and reducing that footprint and, and achieving better environmental outcomes. So I think, you know, we, we've done some modelling work with our Land of Water National Science Challenge, and we know that all, that all of that action is leading to environmental improvement. But at the same time, we also know that we've still got a big challenge in front of us, as, as many of these catchments are still not meeting the required water quality standards. And we're on that journey to try and improve those, those outcomes over time. So I think, yeah, like I said, the job is not done. And as an evidence-based organisation, we, we need to really invest in those solutions and work on those together. And I think probably the last thing I want to say about the relationship is that, you know, and probably this is the key part, is that there has been a very strong willingness from um, environmental NGOs like Fish and Game to actually come to the table and to work in a more open and objective uh, way with us and, and sort of open up that conversation. And their leadership, uh, for example, from Fish and Game and Forest and Bird and EDS, has been really pivotal in shifting that, that conversation to a more constructive place. And I'd really like to acknowledge Ray, who's, who's joining um, on this discussion as well, because I know that um, that discussion hasn't been easy at times, um, but I think this, this shift in leadership that we are seeing has been really important and does allow us to, to get, a, get into the detail and really focus on those solutions together. And I think as a result, we've had a lot of progress in the space, particularly over the last six months or so. We've been working closely together with NIWA and Fish and Game and the regional councils to develop a, a constructed wetland guide to give farmers sort of greater visibility and guidance on how to protect and restore and construct wetlands on their properties to improve environmental outcomes. And we launched that two weeks ago, and it was fantastic to have Ray on, on the radio talking about it instead of ourselves. So rather than it being criticised, we were all in the tent together. We developed that guide. And again, through this partnership approach, we can really achieve much better outcomes together as well. And we've been working on a number of other initiatives, such as a Jobs for Nature application. So we've got a really exciting project that we've applied to government for funding on, uh, working with, with catchments in the Waikato and Southland and Canterbury to really start shifting the dial on environmental improvement. And again, I, I don't believe these projects are possible um, as a dairy sector alone or farmer-led alone. It has to be this, this partnership approach, all working together and, and sort of coming together and, and understanding what do we need to do here and how can we get that action going on the ground. So I think that's been really exciting um, as we've evolved this, this conversation and as we have started to work more closely together in that environmental space. And I think, um, I think the final point I want to make is that, you know, resetting the relationship is not always about agreeing on absolutely everything. There will be times when we do disagree with each other and uh, we certainly don't want uh, to be shying away from our challenges and uh, the NGOs ignoring those challenges within the dairy sector. We don't want them to be doing that either. So we need to understand, you know, we don't want to be getting a free pass here. This is about an open dialogue, um, understanding our challenges together and helping us collectively work towards that. And I think that's what farmers really want to see us doing more of. And and certainly also you know, fish and game have many fishers and hunters who are farmers and all, all of these levy payers and, and, um, and, and members of these organisations um, all want to see us doing the same thing, working together on the ground in partnership to achieve better outcomes through more practical approaches. So I think I, I look forward to, to really continuing this journey together. I think we've achieved a lot over the last six months. The, the conversation's a lot more mature. We're very open to this constructive dialogue. And I think at the same time, uh, from our perspective, you know, we're not shying away from our challenges either. We know what, We know we need to do better. We're trying very hard to do our best. We're seeing a lot of progress but we also absolutely acknowledge that the job is not done yet as far as water quality and ecosystem health is concerned, as well as some of these other challenges that we're talking about. So we look very much forward to continuing that, that journey, that greater collaboration together. And from a dairy and perspective, we're absolutely committed to that, that journey and that approach. Thanks, Rowena. Thank you, David. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, and we will come back to you in a moment, but uh, thanks for that overview to kick us off anyway.
Right. Now, uh, I really enjoyed that David actually acknowledged the previous tension that has existed. It's good we've all moved forward from there. And as uh, David said, you know, we do share so many core values. So it's great to hear about the collaborative work that's going ahead and also where those overlaps are. And uh, yeah, I too am so proud of the work that dairy farmers have done in the, uh, the last couple of years and probably the last couple of decades almost in particular as well. Right. Now, joining me is Ray Grubb, Chair of Fish and Game New Zealand. And uh, Ray, kia ora, good evening. It is very lovely to see you. Where are you joining us from this evening? Nelson, the weather's fine. You should know that. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it is a lot warmer than it has been down here in Dunedin. Very excited to be heading to the North Island uh, tomorrow and just hope uh, their warm temperatures continue for a little bit longer. Uh, Ray, we're really keen to hear about your perspective on the same topic that we've just been chatting about with David, though. How has the nature of your relationship with the dairy sector changed? What did you see as the opportunities and benefits for a closer working relationship? And how have your hunting and fishing license holders responded? Well, it's not enough just to criticise. If you're going to criticise, you need to actually back it up with facts, figures and assistance where it's appropriate. And the other thing is you can treat people with respect. I think that's an integral part of the way fish and game is operating nowadays. Uh, and we've got exactly the same response from the dairy industry through David. But I think one of the things I should do is explain what our brief is. I often wonder whether people actually know why Fish and Game does what it does in terms of advocating for uh, natural environments and particularly advocating for fresh water. So I thought I'd explain that first. I'm not big on platitudes. Um, can I say, by the way, that this is pretty disconcerting. I've never spoken to a an invisible audience before. And if brother-in-law John Vandergoes is out there, John and Kathy, hi. And can you please direct your difficult questions to Richard McIntyre later on in this? Okay, where we come from? We're constituted under the Conservation Act. And the Conservation Act has a lot of rules and narrative around it, but it has two primary purposes. One is to conserve indigenous species and Nicola can talk with authority on that later. Uh, but also it is to conserve valued introduced species, which is where we come in. Both of those require biodiversity. That's te mana o tataya nowadays, and that's an underpinning strategy for government. And within te mana o tataya, there's te mana o tawai, which is in fact a recognition of fresh water as well-being for communities, for all of us as people living in New Zealand. We need to have clean, fresh water. And Tamano Tatai, Tamano Tawai has its three priorities, which is the health of the waterway first, secondly, the health of the communities that are with the waterway, and thirdly, use. And I think nowadays, what has changed and become very clear is that the law does not allow us to profit at the cost of the environment. And I actually think social attitudes have changed significantly. I noticed that the little school in Renwick and Blenheim, uh, very close to a friend of mine, um, has projects to restore waterways running through the school. And children are taught from a very young age to respect the environment. And I think that attitude is coming through in attitudes to the way in which we treat the environment in the farming community as well. Now, part of our brief is historical. Um, one of the things I was looking at the other day was at Bullock Creek in Wanaka. There's a signboard which says up that in the late 1800s, uh, the acclimatization societies were telling people not to put lime in the water because it was detrimental to fish, indigenous and introduced. And uh, we've been fulfilling a role in protecting fresh water since the 1870s both in practical terms, in terms of local body bylaw in those days, and more recently through legislation. Now, in protecting valued introduced species habitat, we need to, we need clean, fresh water, plenty of it. And we need food for those valued introduced species to eat. 
so the technical term is bugs. Uh, the practical term is Diliotidium mayfly, things like uh, Calibratus caddis and Calibriscus, um, for which we fish with comparaduns, and that's enough of that. Uh, but basically, these bugs hatch on the bottom of a river, under stones, come to the surface, they mate in the air, they lay their eggs on the grasses on the edge of the river, and then come back into the river as spent spinners. The, the fact is that sediment kills those bugs and ru ruins the opportunity for them to exist. And Diddy Moe, as a recent introduction, is another thing that has, creates havoc. We also have um, bugs that are in shrubs, uh, things like green beetles, brown beetles. We have grasshoppers, cat, uh, cicadas, all of those things. And all of those rely on the lack of nutrients in water when they come, sorry, the trout that eat them require a lack of nutrients in water to exist and they need good biodiversity to have the plethora of insects that we need to protect our species. So the two key issues that we approach in looking at habitat are nutrients and sediment. They're the killers and they kill natural environments in our point of view. So what do we have in the way of skills in our organisation to back up the uh, work that we do with farming farmers and government? We've got a bunch of scientists, pretty well all of our field staff have got uh, serious degrees in botany or biological sciences. We've got RMA qualified people, I think we've got 11 of them. Uh, we've got 70 staff overall. And we have practical people who know how to make wetlands. Uh, and I talk of Andy Garrick in Eastern Region who has been assisting David in developing a wetlands program that's now on your website. Comprehensive, well put together, excellent piece of work by the two working together. And we also have people who can look at river flows. And as we now know, having drains that run dead straight do not provide good biodiversity and are not good in terms of dealing with um, extra flows and waterways. We need to create structure. We need to slow the water down so that it doesn't erode the banks and create excess sediment. And we have people who can advise on that. And what's our style? Our style nowadays is non-confrontational. And we believe in community partnerships. That's practically people visiting farms as fishers and game bird shooters, getting on with the people on the farms, showing um, that they are not part of this great debate that has to happen at national levels about habitat, um, that they are simply shooters and fishermen and we can get on. Well, we couldn't have had this conversation three years ago. We had dirty dairying. Uh, when I became chair, that got dropped very quickly. Um, I felt it was disrespectful of the people, both in fish and game and in the farming community. And it, it, it didn't achieve a practical purpose. I felt we could do the same things by cooperation and working with people and talking to them. And a year later, I was sitting next to David Berger at the Environmental Defence Society conference, talking about the changes the dairy industry were making. We couldn't have done that many years ago. We can agree to differ, and we should. But we also need to recognise that we each have different priorities. Um, but the overarching priority will always be to mano to wai and fresh water because that our well-being depends on it. So where do I come from? I spent 17 years at Lake Brunner, running Lake Brunner Lodge, owning and managing it in a dairy farming community, working, fishing through, talking to, living with the Shaffreys and the Rotheries and Les and Shirley Graham, Ian and uh, Katie Milne, uh, Katie Milne's mum, used to find us a bit of a pain because she had the best patch on the Arnold River and we were often running through her place. Um, it was, we were part of that community and 
that's what fishers and hunters basically are. They're part of a community. I do remember Bob Burgess and I several times spraying very weak solutions of Roundup on patches uh, along the edge of the Crooked River where the young fellow from down the road was planting. And that was a community initiative that we took, which we rather enjoyed. Um, so what's changing nowadays is I think public attitudes have changed. And I think the law has changed too. The NPSFM 2020 has made a significant difference, national policy statement on freshwater management to the rules around fresh water. And what you've been doing on your farms is introducing science to your farms. You're measuring moisture content, grass. Um, you're measuring individual cows for their production. You're putting all that on computer. What we're asking you to do, and what we think the law now asks you to do, is assess those impacts off the farm, the impact of nutrients and sediment on waterways and your surrounding environment. And one of the things we can help with is ways in which we can help to control those nutrient sediment by, for instance, creating uh, wetlands, advising on that, advising on changing streams so they don't flow at high speed, um, managing critical source areas so that they don't have direct runoff and they're filtered so that we don't get those sediments and nutrients in the streams, managing intensive winter grazing so that there are long buffer areas. And um, yeah, because that is one of our most significant problems, I think, as a community. Right, where do we go from here? Our job is to manage habitat for species we manage and we will continue politely to hold strong views on enforcing the law and assisting to administer the law when it comes to the important parts of preserving biodiversity and fresh water. We consider that around 80% of the work we do actually has a wider public benefit in providing fresh water, providing clean swimming holes for people to have, uh, water for people to drink. It's a byproduct of what we do. It can equally be, and is in many cases now being, a byproduct of it, what you do. And it's not our job to interfere on your farms. Um, it's not our job to compel you to meet government standards. What we can do is advocate for those government standards to be applied in the proper ways through the rules and regional plans. But when we do that, we'll do it with respect and we'll do it hopefully cooperatively. And certainly that's happening now. And we will respect the people who own the farms, who manage the process and look to them being successful in protecting the environment that we want to have both for fresh water and for the species we manage. So, Thank you very much for listening to me. I have been awesome. to death. Thanks so much for that, Ray. They've popped me up on screen uh, with you as well to give you a bit of a wind up so you don't end up answering all the questions before I can throw one at you. So that is Ray Grubb, the chair of uh, Fish and Game New Zealand, if you've just joined us. We're going to welcome back in Dr. David Berger as well, who opened uh, the show this evening. And uh, we've got a question for each of you now. David, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what's the value for farmers of Dairy NZ working with fish and game? What do they bring to the table? Yeah, look, thanks. As Ray said, fish and game also have a lot of expertise in the space around habitat, around flows, around the science and, and policy. And, you know, fish and, fish and game have always um, sort of made submissions based on strong policy as well. So we'd love to work more closely together with them in that policy space. So rather than sort of fighting backwards and forwards uh, via, via um, MFE and what have you, we'd like to sit down with Fish and Game, like we've done recently for the wetlands uh, policies, and really try and seek that commonality and kind of work through that together and come up with those solutions together. Because we know that if we, if we do that, we can probably achieve outcomes faster, which are more pragmatic for, for um, the regulators and for the, for the landowners um, than if we continue like we were in, in, in the long past. I think also to, to raise other point, um, you know, fish and game members like dairy farmers, they're all part of the, the community. And I think there is a lot of opportunity to take a, 
a grassroots approach like New Zealand is great at, you know, working through catchment groups and, and getting real change happening on the ground through, that, through those water quality um, initiatives um, amongst those, those local communities. So I think a lot of expertise there as well and a huge opportunity to continue that, that conversation as is happening in some parts of the country already. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. And Ray, you, you've touched on this, but I'm not sure if you've got something else to add on it. This is a question that's been submitted from our audience. Do you think dairy farmers have been making good progress when it comes to the environment? What are we doing well? And where do we still have work to do? I think we, okay, what are you doing well? You're responding extremely well to the requirements of the MPSFM and to Mano to Wai, and there's a clear understanding of the need to have the off-farm effects of your activities managed. Uh, I think you're doing that extremely well. I think we've got a long way to go in terms of the complications of farm plans uh, and some of the things that go with that. It's not a simple beast. The government has put in putting in place all sorts of people to monitor farm plans, certifiers, checkers, and all those other things. Uh, where I think we can do two things. One is we can actually help each other by looking at how farm plans are best put in place, how the certifiers are organized, what are the bottom line rules in regional council plans and agree on them, uh, because there have to be bottom line rules at some point. And secondly, we can, not have an adversary environment so that you know, when you have an angler or a game boot shooter want to have access through your farm to a river or to a wetland, you welcome them and they'll welcome you as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Ray and David, really appreciate your time this evening. It's great to have you both up here together. As you say, so much of the work you do overlaps and it's good. We can all play in the sandpit together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Uh, remember, you at home have got a part to play this evening. We've already just put a couple of questions to Ray and David that you've submitted. But don't forget, you can just scan the QR code that's on screen right now if you've got questions for our next panellists or head to menti.com and type in the code 9049 to make your question uh, reach us. And don't forget to let us know who it is designed for as well. Right. It is my pleasure now to bring in our panel. We've got Nicola Torkey, feeling you Chief Executive of Forest and Bird, Melissa Slattery, Chair of the Dairy Environment Leaders, and also Richard McIntyre, Dairy Farmer and former Deputy Chair of Fish and Game. So we've got quite a broad range of people joining us this evening, which is absolutely fantastic. Kia ora tato, welcome to you all. Uh, perhaps, Nicola, if we start with you, uh, I hope you're settling into your new role at Forest and Bird. What do you make? though of what you've heard tonight and where do you see the opportunities for farmers and for conservationists to work more closely together? Good evening. Uh, uh, kia ora koutou. <clears throat> Good evening. Yeah, uh, so yes, it's, I think this is week nine now, so I'm quite the expert now that uh, at Forest and Bird. Look, I, I'm a, I was a bit, um, I was thinking a lot while um, Ray and David were talking and I was thinking about community, Ray pinched my line about um, community, but I'll go into that in a second. But I was also thinking about the people in this in, in this room, in this virtual room, and I was reflecting on the fact that nine years ago, I was working with David Berger uh, when I worked for Fonterra, that Ray and I have crossed paths over the last decade uh, or so, you know, and, and it's a great reflection of even on a call like this, where there's, you know, a fairly small number of speakers we, we are all connected I spent a very happy nine years as a scarfie and then some in Dunedin um, and I suppose what might be useful is, is if I could just briefly talk about forest and birds some of you may know it as twig and tweet uh, so we are uh, New Zealand's largest and longest serving um, conservation organization and we're independent so we're not for profit we're entirely paid for by members some of the whom will be on the call thank you um i'm i'm earning my extra hours uh and we uh yeah we've been around for 100 years and our whole job is to give nature a voice right and and so we take that really seriously um 
and the reason that it's really important in New Zealand and, and everybody knows this is we're, we're sort of coming to the crux which is where I think farmers and more broadly the New Zealand community are feeling it uh, of this kind of it, biodiversity crisis so New Zealand has the dubious honor of the highest proportion of threatened species in the world ramming right up against a climate crisis and they're amplifying each other and so the, the the flip side to that is actually when you're protecting nature you're creating resilience and uh and so for the farming community uh that means things like you know wet, there's been great chats already about wetlands wetlands as you know are providing resilience against impacts of floods they're also providing resilience against impacts of drought uh, and um it's it, it it's one of my pet peeves i suppose has always been this idea that um nature in new zealand people kind of think that nature is something that happens over there uh, and so we've got to get past that and i suppose what forest and bird can bring to the table is a conversation around how we are nature positive no matter what we do. So whether that's on a dairy farm uh, or in our towns um, with our kids, you know, and yeah, just to reflect a little bit, you know, uh, we are also part of your community. So for the 130,000 members, supporters and volunteers of Fonterra, what you might, uh, of Fonterra, I've gone back to my old job, of Forest and Bird, uh, what you might not know is that uh, we have 46 or 47 volunteer branches up and down the country who are boots on the ground. So these are people who, um, who get together on the weekends and in their spare time, put on their gummies and go and do nice things for nature. I know that they will be in your communities too. So there's plenty of opportunities there, but much like um, David and Ray, what I think Forest and Bird would like to participate in, and we are in increasingly, I I'm speaking to the farming community probably every day at the moment, uh, uh, while we face this kind of onslaught of policy from the government we're all trying to wrestle our way through that none of it's integrated and you know you're building wetlands for example and that's great because the biodiversity strategy says let's protect all the wetlands and yet we had two policy statements come out last week that said except let's put consenting pathways in place to um, put mines and landfills in them so we've got a confusing policy space um what Forest and Bird can bring to the table is some expertise and we're really open to those conversations. We also have highly qualified staff, scientists, lawyers, planners, um, and we are up for it. We are up for the conversation about what we can do to help. We do have expertise. We have an MOU with PAMU, for example. We are uh, trustees on the Landcare Trust. Uh, many of our members and staff are from the, the farming community and we'll share what we know about the problems We'll share what we know about the solutions and we'll work with you on where we need answers. But I suppose my ask is it has to be an honest conversation and it has to be courageous. And that means it's uncomfortable. But if we're not uncomfortable, we're not going to make change. And then we're all stuck, right? So, let's, you know, I live in Canterbury where, um, you know, some of these wicked problems are, are, you know, coming right to the forefront of you know, um, the sidelines of our kids' sport on a Saturday. We need to resolve these wicked problems and to do that, we need brave hearts. And that means honest conversations, testing evidence and being real and upfront about what the challenge is and therefore the solution. Fantastic. Namahe kiankwe, Nicola. Uh, I loved what you had to say. I promise I won't ever call it twig and tweet and jest again. Fantastic. It's great to put a face to the organisation as well. And it's lovely to hear you talk about connections because we're now moving on to Melissa Slattery. And uh, I got to know Mel through the Dairy Industry Awards. I was 2013 Taranaki Farm Manager of the Year. Richard, who's also in our panel, was the 2013 uh, Milker Equity Farmer of the Year for Manawatu and Mel and her husband Justin were 2015 Canterbury North Otago Shemilka Equity Farmers of the Year so it is there are so many connections just in this uh, Zoom with us all tonight. Uh, Mel what is your take on all of this I'll, I'll stop talking now and hand it over to you. Uh, good evening thanks Rowena <clears throat> and thanks for having me tonight um, it's really exciting to be here and to talk um, with these great uh, organisations, um, my husband, Justin, and I, we're farm owners in Tiaraha in the Waikato, 100 hectares with our three boys. And they're both, um, they're both avid fishers. Um, we have 
family fishing licenses and love duck shooting. Um, so it's, yeah, we all have common interests. We all have um, common, you know, um, aspirations and we're not perfect. Yeah, our farm's not perfect um, and we're on a journey. So we, we have a lot of responsibilities as farm owners and one of them is the environment and leaving our farm in a better place than when we took it over and hoping that we give opportunities to those to our three boys if they wanted to you know go farming and keep carrying on um, on this farm that they can do so so it's we are we're definitely and dairy environment leaders is a great space to have conversations and to learn and grow uh, w- uh, with all of these organisations on the Zoom and with other farmers um, and that's supported by Dairy NZ but farmer led so it's awesome to be here and it's awesome to um, have these conversations and to to be more uh, collective in how we go forward. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Melissa. Uh, Richard, your turn. You're up now. Look, you wear a couple of hats. So I guess both a dairy farmer and deputy chair of Fish and Game. How do you see these partnerships working for shared positive outcomes? Well, I think the first thing is making sure that as as different groups, we understand each other. You know, as has been said, we are part of... um, we're stakeholders within um, society, as opposed to being the only thing within society, and we need to we need to be cognizant of that as um, as, as we look to move forward. Um, you know, the, the the real key thing here is making sure that we <clears throat> we have respectful conversations. Um, <clears throat> sorry, we have respectful conversations with each other, and and recognize our differences when we recognize that we're not always going to agree, but. Um, but when we and when we don't, that we we disagree respectfully. Yeah, that's a really fair point as well. Look, I honestly, I never thought I would see the day when a dairy farmer was the deputy chair of Fish and Game New Zealand. So that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, We've got quite a few questions coming through from our audience. And Richard, it's just on that vein that I'm going to start with you. Have you struggled as a farmer sitting around the Fish and Game table? What's it actually been like? Hey, look, not at all, Ro, not at all. Um, look, I'm, I'm a mad keen um, game bird hunter and an occasional and, and reasonably uncoordinated fly fisherman. Um, so I love getting around the table with, with other game bird hunters and, and fly fishermen and women and working on ways to, um, to enhance and future-proof um, a pastime that we and, and a lot of New Zealanders love doing. You know, but, but equally, I also love being able to bring a a farmer's perspective around the table. You know, there's a saying that if you're not um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I think us as farmers have suffered from that in the past. I'm still just uh, chuckling the way to field days last year. I stopped and went fly fishing for the first time in Taupo. And there's a beautiful photo of me holding my fish out in front of me. And then the next photo in the series is me dropping breakfast and that just like look of horror on my face. So I'm still triggered when it comes to uh, people talking about fly fishing. But it is honestly, it's such a great thing to do. Uh, Melissa, we're going to head over to you next. Do you get frustrated when you see NGOs criticising farmers in the media oh look it's I, i'm not gonna lie here it's, um if you you sit down from a long hard day's work and uh you turn on the telly and there's um, a whole heap of criticism when you've just done everything you could responsibly do for the day and it and it feels uh yeah it doesn't feel overly great but we've moved on from that and um there's a lot that we can do together uh to you know uh, achieve good outcomes going forward. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to positive collaborative media in the future. Fantastic. That's what I like to hear. Um, Nicola, one for you coming through. Do Forest and Bird have an appetite to work more closely with farmers and ag organisations? And on what kind of things? Uh, yes, of course. So um, Forest and Bird represents... New Zealanders uh, and New Zealanders include quite a large constituent of farmers. So um, yeah, I, th- I think it's very much like uh, what the others have said. And I think, in fact, I think every speaker has said it, which is 
what what I think with anything, and I'm having similar conversations at the moment, I don't know, with the hunting fraternity, for example, and um, and that's something that I am not very good at, but learning. Um, but it, it should be a bit, and, and treaty partners and iwi, you know, what any kind of respectful conversation needs to be really upfront about, these are the things we can agree on, you know, these are the things we're really grumpy about and we're probably going to make a racket about over here, but we'll be really upfront about that. Here's some things you're annoyed at us about. Um, but this bit in the middle, that's the magic spot. And there are, we, we risk cutting off our noses to spite our faces by not taking the opportunity to, to, to grab the bit in the middle uh, so yes we're up for that we're doing it in lots of places uh, around New Zealand what I've learned coming into the role is I don't think Forest and Bird's been very good about talking about our boots on the ground work so I don't think most people know that we have 140 reserves and we have these 11 nationally significant projects and we pay people like we've just employed someone to be a permanent full-time uh, trapper and hunter in one of our reserves that we own in um, back in my home turf in the Catlins uh, to protect that piece of land. So we have to be true to what we say we're doing too. And so, yes, for the farming community, what I'm really interested in um, is, you know, I'm interested in working with those farmers, and there are, I know there are many of them, uh, who, who want to put their hand up and say, yes, I'll, I'll work with Forest and Bird on a project over here. And yes, I'm happy for things to be measured and, and for us to test it. And if we get it wrong, we'll try something else. But I, I think like the other speakers, just sitting in the trenches and firing grenades at each other isn't really getting us anywhere. And one thing I would say is I really, I do feel for the farming community at the moment. I don't think you're being served well um, by a, a sort of reluctance from governments to not help you plan through the next several years, which are just going to get harder and harder and more expensive and more expensive if we're not clear now on supporting you to plan for what's inevitably coming with climate change, for example, you know, the climate change legislation, the emissions reduction plan, those are game changers and they're a signal from society about where we need to go. So my question I'll always back and forth to government and raise often in those conversations is how are we supporting the farming community to take those steps? So yes, um, we'll work with whoever to save the nature. Um, so I, I, look, I look forward to hearing from you. I like the sound of that. Uh, amen to a lot of what you were, were just saying there. Uh, Richard, one for you. Do you think Fish and Game are genuine in wanting to reset the relationship and why? Yeah, oh, look, most, most definitely. When I first um, first put my name forward to be a, um, a regional councillor, on my candidate statement, I talked about wanting to um, improve relationships with farmers. And to be honest, I, I didn't think as a farmer I'd actually get onto, fishing, onto the Fishing Game Council, but um, I wound up being the fourth highest, highest polling candidate. And then um, attending the meetings, and in particular the um, National Governor's meeting, I was... Um, surprised, but really, really pleased to see just to the extent, the extent to which um, all the other um, chairs, etc., were wanting to see some change in this area and an improvement in relationships with farmers, and, and that's really flowed through to the top with with obviously a change in chair and a change in CEO, and so we're seeing a, a really good attitude now, and I, I think it's genuine and from the ground up, right from license holders through to the top. Brilliant. Uh, Melissa, one for you coming through on the text line. Look, would you be open to working with NGOs on your farm? What would it take? Oh, absolutely. Yep. No, we, we're happy to work. They've got expertise that, um, you know, that we can utilise. And it's always great to utilise other people's skills. So um, open to working with um, them for sure. Nicola, you can tell this is a real farmer question, this next one, but I think you're going to rise to the challenge really well. If you had one minute, so I think this is your elevator pitch, if you had one minute to really encourage dairy farmers, what would you say? And then they've actually added in because this is your minute. Uh, look, 
I want to be a champion for dairy farmers who are hand on heart doing the right thing and can prove it. And so, you know, we will help you with that. But we've, we've got to also get past this sort of slightly awkward bit in the middle where we say we're doing things and then we say it's definitely making a difference, but we don't test that. So we'll help you uh, if you're up for that challenge. And um, what would I say? It's, it's a, So forest and bird and, and the dairy industry is both elements of our national identity, right? So, you know, we all come from farming stock, whether or not it was me off my nana's farm in Waimahaka or whether it's you on the farm right now, but we are all people connected to nature and this um, and New Zealanders expect us to look after it. So I had an amazing farmer uh, that I worked with when I was at Fonterra out at Te Waihora, and he had planted his waterways 15 years before anybody said you're supposed to. And when I asked him why, he said, I just wanted somewhere for the bellbirds to land. And that stuck with me for a really long time. So um, 100% we should be working together, but we will be the critical friend around the figures out the other end because you can't have a, a bit each way. So if you if we want to change, let's change. We'll help you, um, and and we want to be leaders in this um, space, not laggards. Nice work, nice work. Look, I uh, I thought that was my favourite question, but I think this is my favourite question, and I jested a lot about this in our run through yesterday. So, Richard, you should know this one's coming, and this is not from me, hand on heart. I did not submit this one through menti.com. It's from a farmer who says, "Can you please get to work and reduce my duck shooting license fee? Thanks <laughs> in advance." What say you, Richard McIntyre? Oh, look, look, bro, I'd absolutely love to. Um, you know, it, it's one of those situations, though, that, you know, we've got to obviously um, manage and enhance, um, you know, the <laughs> all the duck shooting habitat and, and game game bird habitat, etc. And, and, and if anything, that's becoming more and more expensive. So we're doing our best to keep it as low as possible. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know if I can guarantee reducing it for you at this point. As long as you make a commitment to try, I think we're okay with that one. I'll come back to you in a second, but I've just got one for Nicola in the meantime. Uh, Nicola, do you think farmers are making progress? What are we getting right? And what do you think we could do better? So it's a similar one that was posed to Ray earlier in the evening. Sure. And um, look, just on that note, I did send Ray a cheeky text earlier. I donate to Blimmin Fishing Game every year because I buy a family fishing license and then I run out of time to do any fishing. So you're welcome, Raymond, Rainsford. Uh, so uh, look, what I, what I think um, is uh, I, I don't, so what I see, for example, are um, farmers doing every so here in Canterbury, farmers passing all of their consents, doing everything they can, ticking all the boxes with rules that do not serve them well in the planning um, framework, which mean that, that, that the water quality is still failing, right? So how do we, I guess my question is, is back to, is back to the farming community. Like, how do we work together in a way where, what would it look like for Forest and Bird and the dairy farming community to be championing some rigor around that stuff so that you could uh, farm within rules that are clear that you don't have to keep kind of um, having to adjust the, um, you know, adjust your boundaries as you go, because I because that's a pain and and uncertainty is unhelpful. So um, I don't know if that was a, a very useful answer because I distracted myself by teasing Ray. Um, but yeah, I, I I guess it's it's. I think there's an opportunity for us to both to be champions. That's going to take some courage on both sides. Uh, and I can assure you that I'm having some really courageous conversations with my team right now about some opportunities to engage with the dairy sector, um, with, with other ag sectors. And it's good. It tests our thinking and it, and it stops us from getting kind of, you know, stuck in our own, um, you know, in our own heads. I'd like to think the same could happen the other way. And, and if you're up for a double opportunity to champion, it's, it's probably around wetlands, um, then we should do that. It's nice to hear someone talking about uh, putting logic into legislation because it doesn't always seem that that's what's happening in real life. Uh, Richard, just finish for you. And this is a really great question. How can farmers and fish and game work together to increase habitat for game birds and hunting opportunities? 
Look, it all starts with having conversations, really, you know, and it's it's awesome that there's this partnership around wetlands. You know, we um we put a wetland in on the farm that I share milk um, a couple of years ago, and that was in consultation with the regional council, but also with um, with Fish and Game, because there's one thing to put a wetland in to reduce um to, to reduce our nutrient runoff and that sort of thing. But there are extra things that you can do to enhance it as habitat for game birds. Um, and, and so so engaging with fish and game as part of that process um, will, will ensure a really good win-win. Fabulous. Namahi nui katoa. Thank you all so much for your time this evening uh, and well done handling some of those curlier questions. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Look, thank you once again to our wonderful panel and to, indeed to all our speakers tonight. And I kid you not, the banter during our run throughs is the best that we've had in all of our Farmers Forum series. And you saw that reflected through uh, with our speakers tonight. Look, it really is great to see organisations willing to work on these quite big challenges together. And we heard Nicola talk about courageous conversations. And that's exactly what we've seen here tonight. You know, when I cast back my my mind when I started farming we would never have had forest and bird we never would have had fish and game fronting with farmers working on things together talking together instead of at farmers and I think that is one of the key things I will take home tonight I'm not sure about you but it's how much of an overlap there and how much of shared values core values that we both have together that have kind of in the past been pitted as a them and us thing but we can actually work on together that we can find that common ground. We hopefully can find that logic and legislation and all work together. We hear so much of this. We're all in this together. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that. But I think tonight, a lot of those conversations, a lot of that intent put forward, I think if we can build upon that and really work together, we can achieve some amazing, amazing things, not only here in New Zealand, but also implements what happens right around the world as well. So look, thank you so much for your time this evening if you've joined us late or you've had to duck a while for away for a while to put the kids to bed look don't worry a recording of tonight's episode will be available in the next day or two it is super easy to find all you have to do is head to the dairy nz website dairynz.co.nz and just search Farmers Forum series. It'll all pop up. Uh, now, look, this brings us to the end of the current series of the Dairy NZ Farmers Forum. <laughs> You can look out for a new series in late spring uh, for a new range of topics, sure to challenge your thinking, provide timely information, and perhaps make uh, help you make some informed decisions for your farming business. Thank you all so much once again to our speakers, to everyone behind the scenes as well that keep our technology running smoothly. A lot of us are farmers uh, and aren't that used to technology, but they have done a wonderful job this series. Also, thanks to the team at Dairy NZ for sourcing the amazing talent, for coming up with the amazing topics, for listening to farmers and getting their feedback. So thank you once again for your company tonight. I'm Rowena Duncan. Good evening. Good evening.